join me this morning in a big wave back at me and to each other and to yourself with this COVID thing. We have to kind of greet each other in some new ways. So great to see you. And uh, I would say also give yourselves a big hug and give ourselves a big hug. So uh, glad to have everyone here. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. We have these three by five cards. Uh, please fill them out. Put them in the basket on your way out along with the pencil. We'll re-sanitize those pencils. And uh, these will be useful for contact tracing if need be. This morning we're taking a joy gift offering. That's an additional offering for our retired church workers who have special needs in our racial ethnic colleges. If you'd like to give your gift in memory of somebody, just put their name on and we're going to send all of our checks together, make it out to First Presbyterian Church, and we will cut one check and send it with those names. We have a concert on Thursday. We've been having noontime concerts that Rochelle has provided for us. They have been marvelous. This week we have two pianists and some songs. So come online and join us through Facebook for that. Any other upcoming information about the church is on our website, welovefirst.org, or Facebook page, We Love First Sebastian. Now, I want to bring up a slide of Ellie. And, uh, you know, we have musical arts, and we put them on display right here. But we, people also participate in visual arts or dramatic arts. And Ellie was one of the first ones that uh, we called for to uh, share in worship her visual arts. And since we haven't been able to print bulletins, I wanted to look past and remind you of Phil and Ellie. And this is one of the bulletins that she did for us for the Christmas season. So we just want to honor that and say, Ellie up there north, uh, we're glad to uh, have your art. Advent. This is the third Sunday of Advent. We're going to light the pink candle, which is traditional for the third Sunday. Advent means coming. It's the things you do and the stuff you feel when someone's coming. You know, if the president's coming to your office building, you fix it up. If you're, someone you're sweet on is coming over for dinner, you make special cuisine. It's not only somebody important coming or somebody special coming and what you feel and do. It also has to do with getting in touch with your need. I mean, if you're sick, you need a doctor to come. And so I want to ask you this morning, on this third Sunday of Advent, who do you need to come? What do you need? And then I want to ask you to think about your answer for humanity. Who does humanity need to come? I think we could have a rich service if we just went around and each one shared the answer to those questions, right? But think for yourself, just, it doesn't have to be a perfect answer, it could be a little vague. And just say a prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, in this hour, come to me, come to us. Let's worship him and let's begin with the candle lighting. Thank you for Pete and ML being here to do that. On the third Sunday of Advent, having lit the first one in hope, the second for peace, we now light this candle in joy. We read in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 and 2, the desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the, the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice gratefully and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of God. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness and world, please come. Amen. Let us worship God. Let us rise and say who it is that we worship using these verses from Scripture. Together we say, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All were created through him. 
all were created for him. He is before all else that is in him, everything continues in being. It pleased God to make absolute fullness reside in him and by means of him to reconcile everything in his person, both on earth and in the heavens, making peace through the blood of his cross. Lord, we are in your presence. We ask you to fill us. You are a great God. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. Our first hymn is, O Come, All Ye Faithful. Our singers will lead us in the first verse, and we will join softly in as Rochelle directs. You know about the CARES Act, it's a relief package that came around from the government months ago to help us with the problems of the pandemic. You know, there is a CARES Act that doesn't wear out, that doesn't come from the government, but comes from heaven above and gives us relief from a whole other kind of pandemic. Our race suffers from sin. Let us go to the God who forever cares for us in Jesus Christ and acknowledge our need using this prayer before us this morning. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. God of grace, help us to admit our sin, so that as you move toward us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise for the assurance of pardon. Jesus says to us, my child, your sins are forgiven. He is saying that to you. Believe this good news and be at peace. You may be seated. And now we have special music from Rochelle. Jesus boy, they made you be born in a manger. Sweet little holy child, didn't know who you was, didn't know you'd come to 
I think I could listen to that all day. How about you, huh? Yeah, thank you. Hey, well, I got to tell you, when I was working on this sermon, I had my manuscript, I was walking on the beach, and the wind blew it out of my hand into the ocean. Um, I did not take that as a sign. I, yeah, yeah, you get this sermon anyway. Uh, you know, God may have tried to send it out to sea, but I got it, and you're getting it. So... Uh, <laughs> Other people more sensitive might have said, this is a sign. Yeah, I shouldn't do that sermon. But not me, not me. Um, yeah, you know, so we live in a world that's got a lot of announcements, right? I mean, uh, you probably have had an wedding announcements from your grandchildren. And uh, some of them will send you graduation announcements in May and June. And then we have... Well, we know back in medieval times, there would be a trumpet blast, ta-da, and then and the king would walk to the banquet hall, right? And sometimes maybe a new doctor joins a practice, and there's a, in the classifieds, it says, we welcome Dr. So-and-so to our, our practice. So uh, we live in a world where that kind of thing happens all the time. And the Bible is that kind of world, too. It has announcements. It has uh, prophetic announcements, uh, Hosea, Micah, those guys. They're, they're all giving a prophetic announcement. There are hymnic announcements in the psalm set to music, Behold your king, uh, like that. There are also uh, apocalyptic announcements with uh, like revelation, a lot of symbols saying uh, what's to come. You got to use your imagination on that. And you kind of feel it, not just hear it. And there are also angelic announcements, and we think of those in this season of the year, because remember, in the birth stories of Jesus, there are an angels announcing, Mary, you're going to have a baby, you know, Joseph, you're going to have a baby. And so we, we know about those kind of announcements. And specifically, that announcement was a birth announcement. That's another kind of announcement we have and the Bible has. You might think of Hannah in the Old Testament with Samuel. Uh, she got a birth announcement. And think of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. And then, of course, as I just said, think of Mary with Jesus. In the Bible, though, the birth announcement's a lot different than ours. In ours, we wait until the baby comes. And then we send it out to everyone saying, you know, his name is you know, Jeffrey Wood. And in the Bible, though, it comes before the baby and tells the parent what the name is. 
Now, you know, maybe you came from a family where there were lots of people in the family telling you what the name of this baby was going to be. Uh, I didn't. I thank God for that, frankly. Uh, but uh, what happens in the Bible is a little bit more like, well, like a pregnancy test. That kind of announcement. It's like, well, you know, the test strip changes colors and, and it announces, you know, you're going to have a baby. And, and just imagine if it also had a name <laughs> come up on it, like William. And you say, honey, we're pregnant, and his name is William. You know, uh, for all the work going into naming kids, I certainly went through a lot of baby books myself and watched all the credits at the end of a movie. I, I think I would have appreciated if the test just told me what the name was, you know. Uh, and then, you know, when your mom says, why didn't you... And, Call him after Uncle Dave's. Well, I couldn't. This test said, name him William. You know, so <laughs> couldn't do it. Just it says William right there. So uh, that's the kind of birth announcement that we get in the Bible. Uh, we've been coming for a week or two now to Isaiah 9, chapter 6. And in that verse, it tells us a birth announcement that a son is being given to us. And he has this extended name. Uh, there's a neighbor of my mother's who's Italian. He, he must have like five or six names and he rolls them off with that Italian sound, you know, Porticelli, and it, it sounds so romantic, you know? I just have Jeffrey Scott Wood, not nearly as romantic. But uh, in the Bible, the announcement has that kind of romantic quality. And the first of the names is Wonderful Counselor. And then there's a middle name, Mighty God. And then there's another middle name, Everlasting Father. And then there's a, a final name, Prince of Peace. And so it all rolls together. And last week, we looked at the first name, Wonderful Counselor. And we noted, particularly for our therapeutic age, that a counselor is not somebody you go and lay out on a couch in front of while they take notes and ask you about your mother. Uh, it's, it's a cabinet member, like in an administration. So what we want to think is a wonderful counselor helps us govern our lives in a wonderful way. And he, he does it by giving us wisdom to the head and encouragement to the heart, by personally being invested in the outcomes of our lives, and by showing a, a kind of restraint where he doesn't do it all for us. He's more like a coach who wants to have us know the joy of, of developing and being able to perform. So for all of those reasons, he's a wonderful counselor. Hear now the word of God, that birth announcement, for a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the Word did become flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, and from his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. So the second or the middle name, the first of the middle names is Mighty God. And you should know, you might just read this someplace and it might kind of straight strike you as strange. So I just, I just want to give you kind of the academic and cultural lowdown. Is that in the ancient world, everybody from Pharaoh to potentate, uh, uh, Caesar, those potentates would not uncommonly be thought of as gods. Uh, it might seem a little weird to us, but it, it wasn't so weird to them. Uh, the notion basically was that the potentate was a representative of God. And just like you would send a, a son on a delegation and he would be vested with all the authority of the king, you know, you hear the, the son speak, you're hearing the father speak. They were sometimes called sons of God, if not God, sons of God. Uh, thinking that they had that representative power, uh, they speak for God. And there were others, I'm sure, who just kind of were megalomaniacal about it, said, well, I really am God, and, you know, you wouldn't want to go against God, you know, uh, that's a 
real trump card to play on your people. And then there were probably others who took it more like Wizard of Oz, you know, the head in front of the curtains and somebody back there. But it was a charade that everybody went along with because that's just the way they did it. So uh, it, it's good to know that. But here's the thing. As C.S. Lewis once famously wrote, you know, you can have a bunch of children in an empty house, and they're playing that there's a burglar there. And so they have all this feigned fear and giggles, and then all of a sudden, there are real heavy footsteps in the hallway outside the door. A real burglar is in the house. <laughs> now, everything is rearranged. The pretending evaporates. And what we have here is that the pretending evaporates. Somehow, profoundly, God himself has entered the house of our history, and he is there in front of us as the mighty God. Now, we know the phrase, the Lord Almighty. This is the same. The Lord God are the same words. Uh, and you just kind of put the adjective in front instead of behind. So mighty God, almighty Lord, almighty God, same thing. Except I've got to admit that for a long, 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 long time, whenever I've heard the phrase mighty God, something pops into my head. And what pops into my head is like, it's like a bad AM radio song. You know how those, you just can't get it out of your head? I just have to admit, for years, when I hear Mighty God, this is what pops into my head. Would you put up that uh, slide for me? Uh, back in the, the eras of Lassie, like I was telling you about, uh, and, you know, Perry Mason, Daniel Boone was Mighty Mouse, you know? I love Mighty Mouse, and I think of Mighty Mouse, it just pops into my head. Uh, I feel very irreverent about it, but I, I feel a little bit helpless too. However, there is a, a silver lining to it, because you know the theme song was, here he comes to save the day, and he stuck out his chest and bullets bounced off of it. And, and that is the message. That's the message. A mighty God comes to save. Now, you know, saving, when you think about it, it's got to have two dimensions. Somebody once said, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog, right? But think about it. Okay, so you, you have this rabid chihuahua, and you've got a Rottweiler. I'm putting my money on the Rottweiler. I don't care how big a heart the chihuahua has, it's just not going to work out. Although I do know that if the Rottweiler is a wimp, that doesn't help either. So to be mighty, to save, you have to have the heart for it, but you also have to have the capability to pull it off. And that's what we have here. This one who is given to us is able, because he has heart and because he has capacity, genuinely to save. Well, we say, okay, well, what did they need saving from? Well, you can guess it just as well as I. They needed saving from pestilence and invading armies and sorcerers and, you know, that kind of stuff. And we're not much different. You know, we, uh, we need saving from a pandemic and from scammers and, and from terrorists, uh, the same kind of thing. And... That's what this one does save us from. He comes to save our race from that. But it's not just that, because all of that stuff I just mentioned back then and now, out there, there's a form of it in here. All of that is in your heart and my heart. You know, there was a, a London newspaper who put out there for op-ed essays, uh, what's wrong with the world? And the shortest one they got was a reply from G.K. Chesterton. And his response to the question, what's wrong with the world, was simply this, I am. That's what's wrong with the world. So we need saving from that out there, but we need saving from this in here. The, the Bible will talk about it in terms of the world, the flesh, and the devil. So uh, the world out there, the flesh right here, and the devil down there. We need saving from all of that. And Paul in one place in Romans says, who will deliver us from this body of death? And you might think of body as being, you know, I can't make my body 
do everything I want to do, and we certainly know about that. And that's true, but he meant it in the sense of the body, of all, like a body of water, the totality of all this that afflicts us, who will save us? And then he doesn't just leave it with a question, he answers it. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have been given this deliverance in one named Jesus. You want to think of that birth announcement. Matthew, the name is Jesus. Why? He will save, mighty God, to save his people from their sins. And he will be known as Emmanuel, God with us, mighty God to save you and me. Now, you may have wanted a new Lamborghini or waterfront property, but the one God gave you is the one you truly need and who is more than you could have ever hoped for. Hope for. He is the mighty God who comes to save you and me. Thanks be to God for the announcement in Jesus Christ of his saving. Let's pray. As our heads are bowed, I'm going to pray through to our offering and Lord's Prayer. And I want to say to you, God, having heard of your blessing, we render now to you our thanks. We render to you our executive center. We render to you our personality. We render to you our past with skills learned and with bruises experienced. We render to you our future with its hopes and dreams. Are you joining me, folks, in praying to God and rendering to him these things in your life? Lord, we render to you our souls for your safekeeping. We render to you, we make an offering to you of our treasures, anchoring ourselves in the life above and the life beyond and the life with you. We pray with these words in our hearts, love so amazing, so divine. I render to you, we render to you, O oh God, my, our, all. And we say, our Father, Join me, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let your eyes rest right here for a moment. And now let us sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Our singers will do the first verse and then we'll join in quietly on the next.
Men and women, brothers and sisters, remember, wherever you are, Christ has put you there. There's something he wants to do through you there. Believe this, rely on his power, his grace, and his love. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. And all God's people join together to sing the Shalom. Would you be seated for just a moment and as we exit let's have the row in back of you go first before you rise to exit that'll keep us from bunching up in the doorway god bless you all